My name is Sarah Woodbury, and today we're talking about Bechtiv Abbey in Ireland. This is Bechtiv Abbey. It, like many of the abbeys in Ireland, is Cistercian. It was founded in 1147 as a daughter house of Mellifont, which has an Irish foundation, a native Irish, because it was before the Anglo-Norman conquest. So Bechtiv Abbey makes an appearance in the After Kill Mary series, and it's on the Boyne River, but it's within the Pale, right? Right. What does that mean? So the Pale was the part of Eastern Ireland that had been conquered by the Normans starting in 1171. It's also the source of the phrase beyond the pale. If something is beyond the pale, it is unacceptable or unseemly. In other words, here be dragons. So what they were basically saying for the Normans was that you don't want to cross the Boyne. You don't want to get outside Norman controlled territory because, well, the Irish were there. Although Bechtiv Abbey is on the, the pale, the, beyond the pale right. side of the Boyne River. And, and the reason for that is that it was actually established before the Norman Conquest. Oh. Throughout this region of Ireland, the way that you can tell if an abbey or castle was built by Irish or by Anglo-Normans is by whether it's on the external bank of the Boyne or the side closest to Dublin. Does, does that mean it was not always a Norman abbey? That's right, it was founded in 1147 by the king of the Irish kingdom of Meath. I'm not pronouncing his name. I looked it up and I would completely butcher it. It was a daughter house of Mellifont Abbey, which is located close to Drogheda, and the first Cistercian Abbey built in Ireland. As we talked about last week, Tintern was also Cistercian. As we've talked about also in reference to Wales, the Cistercians sought an isolated life. So they were suited in a sense to establishing monasteries in Ireland, which also had a lot of um, rural areas, shall we say. This church was dedicated to the Virgin Mary and at one time included several granges, a water mill, and a fishing weir on the Boyne. Recent excavations have revealed evidence of large-scale cereal processing and also of a monastic kitchen garden for herbs, vegetables, and fruit. What we see today are remains of the church, the chapter house, and a cloister, and for the most part, these buildings date to the 13th century, which means that these buildings were built after the Norman conquest. When this part of Ireland was taken over by the Normans, it fell under the jurisdiction of the Lacys at Trim Castle. One somewhat bizarre story that gives insight into monastic politics of the age references Hugh de Lacy, who was killed in 1195 by an axe wielded by an Irishman while Lacy was supervising the construction of defensive works at Duro. His body was buried in Bective, but his head was brought to St. Thomas's Abbey in Dublin. They kind of did this all the time, divided up the body. <laughs> the two monasteries fell out over who had the right to Lacey's remains until the Bishop of Meath intervened in 1205 in favor of St. Thomas's. By this point, the community at Bective Abbey was almost entirely Anglo-Norman. And in 1380, King Richard II ordered that men of Irish birth should be barred from entering the Abbey's community. By now, Bective Abbey had also become one of Ireland's most important monastic communities, and its abbot was a Lord Spiritual who sat in the Parliament of the Pale. For readers of the After Camary series, as Dan said, Bective Abbey plays a role in Outpost in Time. It is also mentioned in the Gareth and Gwen Medieval Mysteries when Gareth and Gwen come to Ireland. Next week we return to Wales to talk about one of its most famous churchmen, Gerald of Wales. There's someone I... walking up behind us. Hello? To... What happened? <laughs> I don't know. Thanks for watching my video. You can click on the playlist or subscribe to my channel to see more. There will be a new video next week. If you want to check out my books, click on the link to my webpage.